it's wonderful to be on this stage again. I was here a few years ago and was just deeply inspired by all of you, by the Marion Institute, and today, these speakers, right? This is incredible. So, yeah. So we're going to have a little bit of a conversation. Prepare yourselves. It is not going to get too technical, I promise. So, <laughs> that's what people would have you believe, right? All of these interlocking problems, or at least that's something that I felt very deeply, is that we've got food insecurity. You think about climate change and all of the things that are happening in climate change. The lack of biodiversity, the oceans are dying. We're not going to have any more coral reefs. Black lives matter. Our men are being killed in the streets. One thing that I needed was hope. This is a map of all of the internally displaced people all over the world in 2014. There were 38 million internally displaced people. And what that means is that people who are moving either inside of their own country's boundaries or to a neighboring country. The vast majority of people in 2014 that were internally displaced came from Syria. And there's a lot of controversy about how much climate change had to do with the conflict in Syria. But what we do know is that natural disasters and weather events are a major cause of social instability. This is collateral damage. One of the things that freaked me out when it came to climate change is that, I mean, if you really go deep into climate change, just read the National White House climate assessment, it will freak you out, right? We're going to have two degrees Celsius raised no matter what. And when I hear things like that and I hear about sea level rise that's going to happen no matter what, no matter how much we advocate for change, what I think about is who's the collateral damage? Who are the one or two billion people that we're then just writing off? Notice how many brown people are in these blue parts of the world. That's who we're writing off. That's who's going to be displaced by natural disasters. That's up to us. So that's me looking really happy to be in that garden right there. Um, for the last few years, I've worked as a nonprofit executive director. I've done climate change work, I've done food systems work, and one thing that hit me really hard was is my family going to be underwater? Are they going to be a part of this collateral damage? Because the things that I was doing felt like a piece of the puzzle, but they didn't feel like the whole puzzle. I was missing something. And more importantly, I didn't have hope. And I talked to a lot of advo advocates and activists about this, that we just know too much about what's happening. And nothing feels like it's going to actually be the thing that's going to save us. So when you're dealing with survival mentality, when we're sitting with the weight of what it is that we carry every day, having hope is actually not negotiable. It's a necessity. I needed to find something that was going to give me hope. I needed to know what was going to work before I was going to make it politically feasible. We need to know that. I needed to know what to advocate for. Right? We want real solutions. So I was looking for real solutions. And that's how I stumbled on carbon sequestration through soil. Now picture this. Someone invites me to a workshop about carbon sequestration through soil. And I said, what? What did you just say? This was in January. I'm sitting in this workshop, and one of the first things they said is, how many of you don't have any hope when it comes to climate change? So I was sitting there. I'm about to move out into the wilderness somewhere, sit next to a tree, and pray. After years of working on the ground, in DC, nationally, locally, TV, etc. 
I have landed on, I need to go move out yonder and sit next to a tree because I don't know what to do. The next thing they said at this workshop was that, okay, here's a scary climate statistic. 32 billion tons of carbon dioxide are emitted into the atmosphere by fossil fuels annually, globally, right? The conservative estimate about sequestering that carbon, getting it out of the air, the conservative estimate is that we could sequester 3.5 to 11 billion tons annually, between 10 and 30%, conservatively. What? How come no one ever told me this? How come no one that I've spoken to in DC is talking about this? And that led me down a rabbit hole, let me tell you. One thing that's an issue is the way that we talk about this stuff. I've gotten really into masculine and feminine dynamics lately. And as a lot of us know, feminine is circular, masculine is linear. Both are needed to do things in the world, being and doing. We have this conversation about reducing emissions, reducing carbon emissions. And what we really need to be talking about is restoring the carbon cycle. Carbon exists in a cycle. One of our issues is that if we just think about getting carbon out of the atmosphere or somehow managing the carbon that's currently in our atmosphere, we get crazy harebrained schemes like we need to blow a bunch of particulate matter in the atmosphere to block out the sun to stop the greenhouse effect, or we need to build these huge machines to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. What? We need to do what? Stuff that just really doesn't make any sense. And one thing about the carbon cycle is that it's not that we need to reduce emissions and that's it. Car too much carbon is in the wrong place, which means that not enough of it is in other places. What does too much carbon in the atmosphere look like? We know, right? Rising ocean levels, the coral reefs, all the stuff I mentioned in the beginning. Movements all over the world are fighting to make sure that what too much carbon in the atmosphere looks like isn't killing our people. Another impact of not enough carbon in the soil is a lot of what Doug was talking about in the previous talk. This is a map of how much we have lost nutrients in our food since 1914. This is the milligrams over time of mineral content. My mom and I were actually just talking about this backstage. This is not a long period of time. This is under 100 years. We've lost the majority of the mineral content in our food. When we don't have minerals, the compounding health impacts that happen are just enormous. There isn't really a way to quantify how much we're suffering because of the lack of nutrient density in our food. If we put carbon back into the soil, the nutrient quantity in our food will come back. Now, this is hella complicated, so I'm not going to go into all the details, but one of the beautiful things that comes up when you actually start to study soil is that there are all these microorganisms happening, growing, feeding, feasting. And when there's carbon in the soil, there's this deal that gets exchanged where, you know, they kind of lock hands and it's like, yo, you give me some sugar, I'm going to give you some nutrients, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's what's going on underneath the soil. But if there's no carbon content, then the micronutrients are like, well, you know what, I'm going to go get my goods elsewhere, because you ain't doing nothing for me. Or they just die. <laughs> That's the other thing, which is really not fun and really scary. Because when micronutrients die, when microorganisms are no longer in the soil, we get erosion. We get a loss of topsoil. The conservative estimate about how much topsoil we have left is 70 years. The scary estimate is 40 years of topsoil left. 
because we have been degrading and degrading and degrading and degrading and not building soil. That's what happens. That's what California looks like right now. Another impact of not having enough carbon in the soil is that we get drought because carbon supports water storage and capture. And when you have an incredible drought like we have, you have the wildfires that we just had this season. You have unincorporated towns in the state of California with 1,200 people who are mostly farm workers who have literally run out of water. And they can't afford to have water brought in. There are people that are actually dying from dehydration in the rural areas in California. And this is on us. This is what we've done. Animals is a bit of a controversial topic. Did anybody see Cowspiracy? Raise your hand if you saw Cowspiracy, if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, we got a couple people. So Cowspiracy is basically saying all of those fossil fuel emissions that I talked about, carbon and methane emissions from cows is so much worse. That's the issue we need to be looking at. We need to stop eating meat, we need to all be vegan, we need to, to, to just basically let all the cows roam free. Save the cows. This is fundamentally incomplete. I'm not gonna say wrong, I'm gonna say incomplete. Again, the issue with cows is that we've just taken them from the wrong place We've taken them out of their natural habitat and they're in the wrong place. They're all squished up together and they're not eating grass, they're not grazing. When cows graze, they actually sequester carbon. They do not contribute to emissions. Cows are kind of like humans. There's no such thing as neutral. Either we are royally screwing everything up over here and we're basically gonna cause our own extinction, or we're doing really good work in restoring ecosystems. That's a cow. A cow is sitting here mooing in the middle and doesn't know how to be neutral, which is a really big lesson, I think, for all of us. So what if it were possible to do all of these things at once? What if it were possible to restore our atmosphere, to increase the nutrient density of our foods so that eating organic actually means that we're getting all of the nutrients that we need? If it means we can get back, into, back in touch with what it is to be in deep relationship with animals, if we can restore our economies, which I will get to, what if it were possible to do all of this at once? It is possible. People have talked about it. If you want more information on any of this, bionutrient.org, the Allen Savory Institute, there's a lot of different places that you can go. You better work. Working landscapes is the solution. This is so much more complex than just we need to be doing regenerative agriculture. There's land everywhere. This urban-rural divide is false. Any bit of dirt that you see needs to be working to restore our atmosphere. We need to be working with it to restore it and make sure that it's healthy. That's the message here. There is a huge strategy that needs to be done to make sure that everything's happening at the same time. So what we do about this situation is build soil. One of the wonderful things about the state of California, even though we are in a drought, is that we got politicians who actually know how to handle some stuff sometimes, which I really appreciate. The governor has created the Healthy Soils Initiative in the state of California. It's gonna be between 20 and $90 million to build healthy soil, because Governor Jerry Brown knows that when you build healthy soil, you sequester carbon. Where's this money gonna come from? It's gonna come from cap and trade funds, because we've taken the science and the research in California around how much carbon is sequestered in soil to a whole nother level, to the point where we can actually get taxes from fossil fuel companies to do regenerative agriculture and soil building. It's gonna be a test. This is what every state should be doing. Where do I fit into all of this? Where's, where's my dog in this fight? As I talked about in the beginning, I've been doing food systems and climate work for a really long time. This inspired me. 
But my dog in this fight is economic development. The vision for me here is that there's a way to connect The vision for me is that when I heard the Trayvon Martin verdict a few years ago, my assumption before hearing the verdict was that it was going to be manslaughter. You know, not, not good, but it, okay, I can deal with manslaughter if it's not first degree murder. And then to hear not guilty, I collapsed a little bit. I, I physically went into the bathroom, locked the door, and laid on the ground sobbing like hacking sobs, racking my body, because I didn't know how to have a son in a world like this. That's really why I do this work. My husband runs a community center in Oakland with young black and brown men, and one of the main things they do is cultural healing. What's so important about that is that the, the weight, the burden, of not knowing if you're going to be able to raise your children safely, of not knowing if you're going to be able to provide for them, of not knowing if your brother or your husband or your father is going to be killed by disease, the cops, any of the things that hit people in poverty. There's a weight. It actually curves your back. It erodes your internal systems. This has been documented. It's social determinants of health. Me, as an African-American woman with a master's degree, has a higher infant mortality rate than a white woman with a high school diploma. Because of the accumulated stress of just what it is to be black in America. The vision for me when it comes to restoring working landscapes is what happens to my body when I go to some of the ranches that I work with and I sit with sheep. The first time I did that, half an hour went by and I didn't even blink. My body relaxed. I was at peace. There weren't horrifying images going through my head about my ancestors working land in terrible ways because it wasn't direct agriculture. There is a way to do direct agriculture that is healing. But what I'm talking about is a soft re-entry to being with land and being with animals. And for people of color and low-income people to be able to get jobs, to be able to do dignified work, to rebuild, takes a green job to a whole nother level. Because it's not just doing energy efficiency work that heals our atmosphere. It's working with land in a way that he heals our spirits and our souls. That's the work that I want to do. Concretely, what that looks like is this year I've been researching the possibility of doing a county-by-county -county analysis in the state of California of what economic development looks like so that we can make sure the people that really need to be put to work doing this so that my city behind can get out in a field with some sheep and get some healing actually occurs. What can you do? Shopping, big thing. If there's one thing that you can do, make sure that you're eating meat that is really, really good meat. Shopping organically is not enough, unfortunately, because organic still degrades the soil if you do it a certain way. There has to be integrated systems of land management that actually rebuild the soil. Talk to your farmers. Check out the techniques that they're using. Live in a climate beneficial way. This is a diagram from Fibershed, because as it turns out, we can also grow wool and cotton in a way that sequesters soil. Anything that happens that requires land can be done in a way that sequesters carbon and regenerates the atmosphere. The padding in your mattresses, absolutely everything. Look at that. Think about a climate beneficial lifestyle. Finally, Get out in the streets. You've heard a lot about this in the previous speeches, so I'm not going to say too much about it, but this is a photo of me, my parents, and my husband at the People's Climate March. We all advocate for this stuff. I know that you wouldn't be here if you weren't a deep advocate for this work. I thank you. I thank you.
for the work that you do. I'm in it with you. And there is hope. We're going to get it done. Thank you very much.